All right. So Bismillah. Let's begin. So I want to start with. Um, So there's a statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that I think is a good starting point. Um, it helps us understand the importance of the prayer um, and its role in a, in, in a believer's life. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is recorded to have said, the first of a servant's deeds for which he will be taken to account on the day of resurrection will be the prayer. So of all the things we do in our lives, the first thing that we'll be taken to account for will be the prayer. If it is sound, he'll be safe and successful. But if it is corrupt, he will have failed and truly lost. This helps us to understand that the foundation of our entire religious life is based on the prayer, right? So you have the five-time daily prayer um, that you if, you, if you think of, you know, somebody who um, is Muslim for 30 years, right? That's a daily practice that deepens over those 30 years, right? That if being done properly isn't the same prayer in year one that it is at year 10, that it is at year 20, that it is at year 30. Um, so what we will talk about today is how to perform it properly, um, which might be analogous to... Um, learning how to drive, for example, right? You start off with some of the rules, you start off with some theoretical things, um, but even if you ace the driving test, you still start off as a very conscious and, you know, rigid driver. I mean, it's only with real practice that you, after a while, you become very comfortable, right? Um, you're not on 10 and 2 anymore, that, that you can do it and actually start to enjoy the scenery of the drive. You could take a scenic drive. But if you take somebody who's, you know, got their driver's permit, there's no way that they're enjoying the scenery. They're, they're just trying to stay in the lane and they're very nervous, etc. So I, I share that analogy to say some of the spiritual lights of the prayer might um, not be so apparent when you're in your head a lot, trying to make sure, like, oh, what am I supposed to do now? What do I do next, etc. But just know that, like everything else in life that we've learned, right, uh, once you know it and you become comfortable, that it changes the experience itself. So you will get there, God willing, right? So this is the most important practice for a believer. It's a central pillar of your spiritual life. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in another... Um, uh, report, he, he compared it to the central pole of a tent. You know how the tent is held up at that one central pole. If the other ones come out, it's okay. The, the, the tent will stay standing. But if that central pole isn't there, the entire structure can collapse. So the centrality and importance. So this is, um, as you may know, five times a day, we take a break from whatever it is that we're doing, um, and we perform the prayer. Now the prayer is, as you might already know, a structured devotional act. It is something that's revealed to us. So sometimes we pray, we use the same word in English, um, to pray to God. So sometimes you could be in a difficult situation, or you just have a need, and you pray, and you say, oh God, please help me, please grant me this, or please heal so-and-so, give them good health, right? Those are prayers. But when we say the prayer, kind of with a capital P, what we mean is a, uh, a structured ritual that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by the Archangel Gabriel. So he was taught the prayer by the Archangel Gabriel, and then he in turn taught his followers. Now you can see, even in you know, the Old Testament, New Testament, you, you can see references to the prophets of old praying. But we don't know exactly how they prayed. We, lo like we can see that they prostrated sometimes, they bow, you know. We, we have sort of bits and pieces of it. But with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we have the entire prayer preserved as he prayed. Um, and that's quite miraculous. If you were to think for a moment, um, and this, is, this isn't meant in a polemical sort of way, but just more to appreciate what we, what we still have. I think that if, if, if Jesus were, you know, and he will return, but when he returns, if he were to walk into a church he may not recognize the service as well. He won't say this is what 
you know, me and my, my, my uh, disciples were doing, or this, I know exactly what's happening. Uh, it might look different to him. It, it would look different. And depending on the church, it, it might look very different to him. Um, but the, the um, authenticity of that original practice has been lost with 2,000 years, right? And you could say the same for Judaism and probably some of the other religions. Whereas with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, I think if, based on the, the records that we have and the reports, if he were to come in and see Muslims praying, he would, he would not feel that, this, that he doesn't recognize what's happening or things have changed radically since his time. You know, there might be carpet instead of straw mats. You know, the, it, it would be sort of the details, but he would see Muslims lined up in rows facing Mecca and performing the prayer in, in the identical fashion that it was 1,400 years ago. So that's, that's kind of miraculous. I don't know that there's a, a, a founder of a religion whose exact mode of worship, the, the exact ritual of the prayer has been preserved for 1,400 years. Right? So that's, that's, that, that's quite a miracle. And it's also a Muslim today. You could get off of a plane. You could be in China and walk into a mosque and join the prayer and not be confused. You could go to a mosque in Indonesia, Kenya, you know, uh, Russia, like any, any mosque, and the prayer is the same. You don't say, what are they doing? This is, you know, I'm in, I don't know, I, I've been to a mosque in Japan, and you, you, you don't say, oh, what are they doing here? This must be the weird Japanese way. It's, it's the prayer, right? So that's, that's, that's quite miraculous. Um, particularly when you think about a time before something like the internet, which would allow people to communicate. When people started to practice the prayer in different parts of the world, you give that a few centuries, usually things change if they don't have a strong foundation. But, um, you know, and they all come together, like in the city of Mecca for the pilgrimage, and they can all pray together from all parts. They can't speak to each other. They can't have a conversation about, would you like some grapes, right? But they can pray together. So that's, that's, a, that's a, I think, a great miracle. So we're going to cover the prayer um, in two main parts. And that's right on that first page. There's preparing for the prayer. And then there's the prayer itself, okay? So the prayer itself, yes, ma'am. Of course, yes. 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 Uh, yeah. I know in English it does mean different. So, um, is there, like, if there is any, um, like, are our Arabic words to, yeah, like, to refer to one another? Yes, yes. Um, even in English there is, but it's just not used very commonly. So, in English, you, you, the, the, the word most people will use is supplicate, to, to, when, is the one that you ask God. Can you give me this? Bless me this. Bless the food. You know, bless my friends. You know, etc. Um, but it's it's kind of an older word that most people just say. I, I pray. That's that's that. But that that word in Arabic is du'a. That's when you ask God for something. And then salah is the the daily prayer with the capital P, the one that we're talking about here. That's the the you know the second of the five pillars that every Muslim. Um, so that that that. Statement from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he says the first act is the salah that you'll be asked about on the Day of Judgment, right? So that's, that's the prayer. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, yeah, there is. So one, we, we, we face together, right? So we're facing the same direction. 
Um, but also, on the other hand, the Prophet Muhammad, he said that when you leave space, he taught us. He said you have to pray close to each other. When you, get, when you leave gaps in the prayer line, you, that, that distance creates a distance in the hearts. So by coming close together, I mean, think about this. Um, have you ever, have you ever, this is just, you know, have you ever seen a friend that you haven't seen in a while, and they come and they get excited and they hug you, and then the person next to you, they kind of shake their hand, like, hey, nice to meet you. That difference, even just in that physical distance of the hug creates a different feeling than the handshake, right? So there's clearly, there's, there's a relationship between the closeness we develop spiritually and the physical distance. And so the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he taught us that praying together affects the community's hearts. That's very important, that, and, and that's why there's such an emphasis on praying in groups, right? Because you get more reward, because if you're praying together, you engender a kind of brotherhood and sisterhood, a kind of bond, because you're, you're sharing in this devotion. So, I mean, just imagine somebody's praying three feet away from you versus somebody's shoulder to shoulder with you. There's a kind of intimacy there as you worship God together. Otherwise, it's, you know, worshiping God as individuals in the same room. So I think that's, that's part of the reason. But the, the, it does impact that, that relationship. You're welcome. Absolutely. Yeah, and feel free to ask your questions um, as they come. So we'll start off with the preparation. Okay? So if you think of the prayer as a, a sanctified act. So I, I just want to ask, has there, everybody has seen someone pray? Has everyone seen the prayer? Right? So you'll notice in the prayer, um, when somebody is in prayer, they're in this, they're in a sanctified state. They don't talk, they don't, right? You're in the prayer, and then you exit the prayer, right? So you have the prayer is, is a closed system, so to speak. So we're going to talk about what you do before you can enter into that sanctified state. So if you think about, particularly for sort of, you know, in, in, in Old Testament, that the temple was a place that you couldn't enter without some kind, without a purification, sometimes a sacrifice to enter into the presence of God, or to to, be, to, to enter to become closer to God. That is a is kind of a preparation for what the prayer is for us, right? So, in order to worship God in this specific way, you can't just walk into it. You have to prepare. So, the preparation. I, this is the part that I'd like everybody to remember. There's just there's four things you need to have in order to be able to pray. If you do the, if you check off these four, they're called preconditions. You sort of they're kind of like prerequisites that you you fulfill, and they're they're right there um, in the list. Number five is just a modifier of knowing when to pray, but they're the ritual purity, which is the washings, and we're going to talk about that, and then having cleanliness, making sure your body and clothes are clean, facing towards Mecca and then covering the body, okay? So what we're, we're going to do now is we're going to go into each of these four in more detail. Is everybody following me? Okay. If you look at numbers one through four, number one is probably going to be 80 to 90% of what we talk about, right? Ritual purity makes up the most of it, the washings. Once you learn how to do the washings and you understand how they work, the other three are actually very, very easy to know, and they're, and they're more intuitive. Okay, so if you learn how to perform the washing, which we'll cover now, the next thing that you'll have to understand is, or learn, is what things necessitate me having to make that washing, right? So um, let's say I don't, I'm not in a state of ritual purity, right? And then I wash, I perform the wudu, that's the ritual washing. I perform the wudu, and now I'm in a state of ritual purity. I can pray. I need to know what things would require me to have to make that ritual washing again, the wudu. So we're going to learn both. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Okay, bismillah. Let's begin. So I'm going to have you guys, if you look at the second um, page or face of this. Um, so the steps are that you formulate the intention. And this is in your heart, right? So this is important because intention uh, is what separates washing, you know, let's just say you, I don't know, you just played us, you just were exercising. And 
so you're, and you're about to eat dinner. So you kind of wash your hands, you kind of wash your face. What distinguishes that kind of a washing from wudu? It's intention. that You are intending the ritual washing in order to attain that ritual purity. Okay? So you just make that intention in your heart. You make the intention. You begin by saying Bismillah, which means in the name of God. Right? It's written there for you, Bismillah. And then you'll begin by washing your hands three times. Right and then left. You're going to go up to and including the wrists. Okay? Then you're going to rinse your mouth three times. Okay? And you're going to swish the water around. You know that. Right? You're going to swish the water around. It's also good if you kind of just insert your finger to just make sure you don't have food particles. Right? Something like that. But you're going to swish it out three times. And then you're going to rinse your nose. So in order to do this, you're going to bring up with your right hand. You'll bring up a little bit of water. You'll just gently sniff the water. Right? You don't want to snort the water. That's very uncomfortable. Right? So you just want to gently sniff and then blow out right away. And so you're, you're, you're cleaning the nose. So hands three times, right and left. And whenever there's two limbs, it's going to be right before left. So right and left. Rinse the mouth three times, swishing it around. Rinsing the nose three times. And then you're going to wash the face three times. Now the face, it's important to understand, right? Um, it, it's from the top of the natural hairline to the bottom of the chin. And then from ear to ear, this whole area should be washed. So whenever we say wash, what we, what we mean by that is that I'm going to pour water onto my face, and then I'm going to rub, right? And so everything in this area should be washed. So that would obviously include my nose, sort of this part that's under the nose, my lips, and close up my eyes, right? Um, and, I would, and I would wash it three times, okay? Now... I shaved my head. My head is bald. I still would wash. I wouldn't say I don't have any hair, so this is all my face now. This is still where my head would begin and where my, sorry, my, my face would begin and this is where my face would end and ear to ear. Now, if you have facial hair, you have to distinguish between what, they, what the, is the scholars call thick facial hair and then thin facial hair. So if it's thin, such that you could see the skin underneath, right? Then when you wash the face, you should sort of massage the water down to the skin. Because if the skin is visible, the skin should be washed. If you have thick facial hair, there's people who have, you know, nice beards, right? I, I'm, I can't grow a nice beard, right? The thick ones in which the skin is no longer apparent, you don't have to massage the water all the way down. You wash it as if it's skin. You just sort of wash it as if it's part of the face, right? So then you wash the face three times. Now you're going to wash your arms, okay? Arms or limbs, so we're going to do which side first? The right before the left. So you're going to wash from the tips of the fingers all the way down to the, to the elbow. Now, one of the tricky things is if you think about it, if you wash your hands like this, and if you think about this, if you open your fingers, you didn't wash in between the fingers and the webs of the fingers. So you're going to use your, if I'm washing my right arm, I'm going to use my left arm, and I'm going to, do you see how I, I interlace my fingers like this? To get the webs of the fingers and in between the fingers, like that. Okay? And I'm going to, you know, get all the crevices. I'm going to, I'm going to do that three times, and then I'm going to wash the left side three times. Okay? From the tips of the fingers up to and including the elbows. Any questions up until here? I saw your hand first. Go ahead. That is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That's when he did the, the wudu. He would do it three times. He loved to do things three times. And he said there is a blessing in doing something three times. So there's, um, he, he liked to do things in threes. And he liked to do right before left. Um, because there's a, there's a kind of blessing that descends in these, uh, in, in these numbers. And I think it's also interesting we have that third time's a charm and, and, and as, a, as a cultural thing. Um, but there's kind of, we'd say third time's a blessing, probably. Yeah. I think I saw your hand. There are, yeah, there are not. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm 
-hmm. For the wudu, you mean? Yeah, correct. Wudu would just be with water. Yeah, we're going to... Yeah. Yeah. If if it's what I would say is is and I don't know the different kinds of makeup, so I apologize. But if it's, it, I would just think of it is it is it something that's a barrier, thick enough barrier to prevent the water getting to my skin, then it should be removed and then and then it can be washed underneath. Um, but if it's something that you know maybe doesn't create a barrier to the skin, then that might be different. Um, but the, the point is, I mean, this can happen even outside of makeup. Um, sometimes, you know, different, different kinds of jobs, you can have like, you know, things get on the skin that create barriers. They're sort of like waterproof. Like, for example, I had a friend who was a painter. And I mean, it's just like impossible for him to not have globs of paint every day. And he would just sort of really have to scrub to get the paint off in order to make sure the water gets through for the wudu, right? Um, Again, I would just understand it as a concept, maybe talk to some of the sisters in terms of, of, of the best ways to do those things. Um, but the water should reach down to the, to the surface of the skin in order to wash it. And then, uh, sorry, I think, Patrick, you had a question, and then I'll come to you. Great question. Yeah, so the first hand washing is actually more like a preliminary wash to make sure your hands are clean as you do everything else. You rinse here. But then when you come to this washing, you're washing the arm, and the hand is part of the arm. So the hand gets washed twice. And that first one, you don't even have to get into the, you know, the webs. and you're, not, you're just washing the surface to make sure everything else that you do, the water is clean. OK. Um, yes. Actually, I, I want to take a step back. This will hopefully just be a brief comment. Um, when you make wudu, the water that you use should be what we would just call regular water, right? It shouldn't have any color, taste, or smell unless it occurs that way naturally. So sometimes you ever taste well water that has a kind of a taste to it, um, or there's a stream that has a little bit of a color to it, right? Or it might have some algae or some, you know, looks kind of coppery, right, the, 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 the color. If it's naturally occurring that way in nature, then, then you can use that for wudu, right? But otherwise, it should be what we just we, we call water. Um, if something were to change the color, taste, or smell, let's say, let's say I had some water, like we're camping, right? Because we, we're so spoiled, we just think of you go to the faucet and you have water. Let's say we're camping and I had some, uh, I had a bottle of water and I said, oh, I'm going to make wudu later. So I have this and somebody comes and they... I don't know. They put some supplement in there to make to make like a, a drink out of it, and it changes the color. It's now pink. Can I make wudu with that water? Right, because it's changed. It's probably its color and probably its taste. Right. So then I have to get another another um, bottle of water. Okay. Okay. So we're about halfway done. Right. So we're, I'm going to review one more time. All right. So you're going to make the intention. Yes, please. Yes. Great question. Uh, right three times and then left three times. Yep. So we're going to wash our hands, right and then left. Please. Yes. Yes. Yes, any way that it's occurring in nature, you can, you can uh, make wudu that way. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you're asking about the arms, right? Anything that's... Yeah. Yeah. And the feet. Yeah, yeah. So typically we do the three, 
and then the three. When you wash the hands, sometimes you know you end up washing hands together. Um, but when you do arm and arm and foot and, and and foot, yeah, you would do three on the right and then three on the left. Is that is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. So to review, you'd wash your hands three times, right? You'd rinse your mouth three times. You'd rinse your nose three times, and then you would wash the face three times, right? So you pour, and again, washing means I'm pouring the water and I'm rubbing the skin. I'm not rinse. So if you think even in, in linguistically, we say you rinse something, you just pour water on it. So I can't stick my head under the shower head and just let water go. That, that wouldn't be enough. I'd have to wet it and then I'd rub my face, okay? And if I have light facial hair, I'm going to massage the, the, the water through. If I have thick, then I'm just going to treat it like it's my face and like a, continu uh, a continuation of my face. And then the right arm, reminding you guys to sort of interlace the fingers, and then the left arm. Yes? Yeah, I, I because the, the, I'll give you the principle and then I, the problem is I just don't know what the different kinds of makeups do, right? I, I really don't. So to, if something is a barrier between your skin and the water, then you should remove it in order for the water to reach. Yeah. Yeah. If, uh, and like I said, whether that's paint or whether that's something you put on intentionally or unintentionally, right? If it's a barrier for the water to get there, then when you're not, you're not making wudu, right? You're, the, the wa you're not washing your face. Right, so the water has to reach the skin, and then it has to be rubbed. So what I would, the part that I will defer to sisters on is sort of the details of it. But generally, if you feel like the water isn't reaching the skin, then you should remove that, make your wudu, and then pray, and then sort of continue on. Does that answer the question? Okay, all right. So now we've got, we've done up to number seven. All right, so we've got three more. Now, if you notice, there. In the um, in parentheses, I have wipe for these two things. So the head is from the beginning of the natural hairline, right? Even if you, if you, even if you shave your head bald or you have a receding hairline, none of that matters. It's where the natural hairline would be, all the way to the back, the nape of the neck, right? So I'm going to demonstrate here. I'm going to 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 wipe is to wet your hands. So if I had a faucet, I'd collect water. I'm not pouring the water onto my head because I'm not, I'm not washing my head. I'm wiping. So I collect the water and I just let the water fall. My hands are now wet. So I, I put my fingers together like this and I just, I'm going to wipe like that. That's a wipe. Okay? All the way to the back. If I had long hair, right, I would just pull the, pull around the hair. Right? So I would w wipe from the front and then just wipe the end of the hair. Okay, one time. Wiping will always be one time. The washings uh, will are, are are three. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna put an asterisk on some of that shortly. Um, so you wipe the hair, um, and that will be uh, uh, done once. And then it's also recommended to when you wipe back that you wipe front. So this is one and two. If you just do this, that that's enough as well. Um, it was something the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, liked to do. He would wipe them backwards, and then he would also he would just you don't you don't wet your hands again. You just you return the wipe. Yes, you raise your hand. No, no, you're yeah. It just you're just wiping the surface because it's a wipe. It's not a wash. We're gonna get to the ritual bath, the ghusl, and that one it does have to reach the scalp, but, but we'll, we'll we'll get to that. And then you'd wipe the ears. So same thing. You'd, you'd wet your hands, let the water fall off, right? And I now have wet hands. And you'll wipe the ears. You're just going to wipe the outer part of the ears, right? You put your fingers in here, and you, and, and you wipe like that one time. And then the last part is you wash the feet. Right foot three times, and then left foot. And that's up to and including the ankles. So the ankle bone should be washed as well. Like you should see that part wet. The underneath, right, should be washed. Um, now, in between the toes is not a must the way it is for the hands because we're, we have the dexterity in the fingers. They're, they're sort of five different digits. The foot almost acts as if it's one. It's, 
it's recommended. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to do it. Right? He, he would insert a finger in between the toes. But if you don't do that, it's still a valid wudu. Okay? Um, any questions on just the mechanics, the how to do these? Okay. I saw your hand first. Yeah, for the wudu or for the bath? For wudu. For wudu, yeah. So, as long as... So what distinguishes wudu is that you intend it to be wudu. That you're saying, I intend by these washings to ha attain a state of ritual purity so that I can perform the prayer, so that I can touch a, an all-Arabic copy of the Qur'an. There's certain things that you, 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 you need to have ritual purity for. You have to have wudu. If you do that and you wash these limbs, then you have wudu. If you're in, a, if you're taking a shower, for example, and you, and in the, you know, you're done with your shower, you're in the middle of your shower, you can make that intention and say, okay, I'm going to make wudu, um, and I'm, 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 I'm going to make that intention, and then you're washing those limbs with that intention, you would, you would also have wudu. Yeah. Um, I think you had a question next, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they may be. Yeah. Yeah, you can. You don't have to. But usually from washing your feet, even just the rubbing of your hand on the foot, it, it by the third time, both should be clean. Now, the, what I would say is, I don't know, you might have dirtier feet, not you as a person, but because let's say you're, you're doing gardening work, right? Um, and you have dirtier than usual feet, like you're wearing sandals, or you got in the mud, or something like that. You can wash a fourth, and the feet you wash until they're clean, um, and, and your hand you can, you can wash afterwards as well. But yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. So I want to review this one more. Oh, yeah, you did have, I'm sorry. No? Yeah, we're going to talk about that. That's that's a great question, um, but I want to answer it sort of in a different context, if that's okay. So so we'll put that on hold. So when everybody cl close your 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 cards, your cheat sheets here. All right. So what's the first thing we do? So I want everybody to imagine we walk up to the uh, faucet, right? We're getting ready to make. We'll do what's the first thing we do? Intention. So we're going to say okay. And it's just in the heart. That this is like, I, I'm intending to do this. You can't sort of wash your hands, wash your face, wash your arms. Like, oh my God, I'm like halfway through wudu. Let me just make this a wudu. You can't. You have to intend that from the beginning. That this is what I am doing. Because intention is what, what makes everything, right? Especially your worship. It has to be for God, right? Okay, so intention. And then what's the first thing? Bismillah. And then? The hands. We're going to start with the hands. Three times. And then the mouth three times, swish and right and spit. And then the nose, lightly sniff, don't snort it. You'll only make that mistake a couple times and then you'll be very careful, right? You're going to sniff and blow out. And then wash the face three times, right? Light facial hair, thick facial hair, right? And then arms, arms right and left. And you're going to interlace the fingers. You know, get the fingernails, right? And then left three times. Up to and including the elbows. You don't stop here. You get the elbow. Okay? And then head. What about the head? Wipe, right? So make that distinction, right? So wipe. So what? wet it. I'm going to do like this. Get all the entire head. Okay? And then back. And then ears. So wet my hands again. I'm going to wipe my ears once. Once, once. And then feet. Right? And then left. Up to and including the ankles. You want to get that ankle bone and underneath, not just the top of the foot, the sole of the foot, the back of the foot. Okay? Um, and then you're done. Okay? And then it's good, it's, it's, it was a, a practice of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to say the shahada after the prayer. 
after the wudu, sorry, that you finish the wudu and you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That's just an added blessing. So now, I'm going to put an asterisk. What happens if you forget something? You finish the wudu and then you realize, like, oh, I didn't do A, B, or C, right? Um, let's say you remember an hour later, right? The scholars have identified based on you know, sometimes the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he made wudu, he would do it like this. Sometimes he would do it like this. So one thing is, if you, if you happen to forget, you don't do it three times. Right? Let's say you realize you didn't wash your arms three times. You didn't wash your feet three times. You just, as long as you've done one time of a complete washing, where the water reached all of it and you rubbed the entire limb, it's still a valid wudu. Okay? Um... If you forget to um, rinse the mouth or the nose, it would still be a valid wudu. Okay? Um, so what that means is, as long as, and, and if you forget to wipe your ears, that would be a valid wudu. So as long as you wash your arms at least once, you wash your face at least once, right? So you, I can forget second and third time. As long as I've wiped my head and I've washed my feet, right? then it will still be valid. So if I, if I leave or I run out of water or something and I say, oh, I don't think I, I, I rinsed my mouth three times. Can I pray? Yeah, I can still pray. It's still valid, right? It doesn't have the full blessing, but it's still valid, okay? So it's important to know which things are, um, if omitted or if forgotten, would, would nullify the wudu um, and which ones uh, would not. Can I ask a question? How, how many of you have the book being Muslim? Okay. So, that was that everybody? Sorry, one more time. Is anybody not? Okay. Okay. So, in there, um, there's, a, there's a footnote that details what happens if you forget. Which ones can you not forget? Okay. So, that's not here on the card. Okay. Now, what things invalidate the wudu? Right? So we've got a list right here. What are the things that invalidate the wudu? So they're a list of bodily events or things that, um, that are associated with bodily events. So the, the, the first two are simply what we'd call using the bathroom. So it's either urination or defecation. Passing gas. The fourth is a deep sleep. The reason... You'll notice that the you know deep sleep is something in which it's associated with that you wouldn't know whether or not you passed gas. You would you're not you don't have the awareness of your body's um, sort of happenings, right? So deep sleep. So a light sleep, right? So you know sometimes you're kind of dozing off a little bit, your eyes close, but if somebody calls your name, you're like, huh? Yeah, no, no, I'm here, right? That's a light sleep. You would notice if something happened in your body. But if somebody calls your name and you don't wake up, then that's considered a deep sleep. Or sometimes they'll say, if you have like a pen in your hand and, and you doze off and you were to drop it and that didn't wake you up, then that's, that's a deep sleep. A deep sleep would, would invalidate the wudu. Um, and then there's um, what's called pre-ejaculatory fluid. So this is when, when there's sensual arousal. If, if anything is emitted, fluid is emitted, that would invalidate the wudu. Um, intoxication. Now... You may know that intoxicants are uh, forbidden, but even a medical intoxicant, like if you were to get anesthesia, for example, anything that where you would lose your awareness of what's going on, that's still a type of intoxication, right? So it's a medically induced intoxication. Psychosis. So there are people who suffer from a kind of mental illness in which their awareness of the reality around them is, is impaired. They, if, if they go into a psychotic state, God forbid, right, and this happens, when they come back in, they would have to make wudu again because you can't, they can't say, oh, I, don't, I didn't pass gas. Or I didn't, you know, they're not aware of themselves. Um, any loss of consciousness, so somebody passing out, right, um, would, would also. Um, sensual touching or kissing with one's spouse, right, um, that would also invalidate the wudu. If it's not sensual touching or kissing, if it's, um, you know, hey, could you hand me that, and they hand that to you, or they kind of, you know, running out of the door, kind of a peck on the cheek, right, that are kind of the way that you might even kiss your mother, for example, 
or your father, right? That's not sensual. That doesn't create arousal. Now, if one is aroused by something like that, then that would invalidate the wudu. But there's, you know, there's not all touching between spouses um, uh, would be arousing. And then the tenth applies to a, a man, which is um, if, if, if you touch the, 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 the penis, the private part, with the palm of the hand. Not, the back of the hand wouldn't uh, invalidate the wudu, but the palm side would. Okay. So these are the ten things um, that if they were to happen, they would take you from a state of, if you had wudu, that you would go into what's called minor ritual impurity. So do you guys see this triangle over here? So this is, I think, a very useful diagram. You have to be at the top in that white triangle in order to make wudu. Uh, sorry, in order to, 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 to pray. Sorry. If you, have, if you see that left side, the invalidators of wudu will take you down one level, right? So if you had to use the bathroom, you urinate or defecate or something like that, then you need wudu in order to pray again, in order to be in a state of ritual purity, okay? But there are things that would cause you to go into a state of major ritual impurity. So that's what we're going to talk about next. But before we do, I want to pause and say... Do we have any questions about the invalidators of wudu? Yes. Yeah. So there are. Um, yes. So there are. Uh, if you are wearing some kind of, you know that. So the scholars differ on this. If you have a sock that is somewhat thick, right? You know, sometimes like men's dress socks can be pretty thin. Um, and if you want just sort of a ballpark of the thickness or thinness, if you spilled water on your foot, would your foot get wet? Or is the, is the sock thick enough that it's kind of water resistant? That'd be waterproof where you could put it in a river, right? But it has to be water resistant. So if it's thick enough to be water resistant, and it's high enough that it covers the ankle and it covers the entire foot, there are some dispensations from the scholars that you could wipe over. If you had wudu when you put it on, right? So I have wudu, I'm going out to work or I'm camping or, you know, and I have these really nice, thick, sturdy socks and they go above my ankle. I put them on. If I lose my wudu, I can, and I make my regular wudu, I can wipe over the, the foot by wiping the top and the, the sole of the foot together. Yes. You're right about that. That's, that's an exception that, that's, that can be made. But you have to have had wudu when you put it on. No, and then if you take the sock off, then you can't put it back on and then, yeah. Go ahead. Correct, yeah. Um, you can, I, it would also have to cover the ankle. So it's any kind of foot gear that goes above the ankle, um, but then you'd have to, you couldn't take that off then to pray, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, if you, yeah, so if you're doing it with, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Any questions about the invalidators? I think they're pretty straightforward. Um, again, these are bodily functions that usually have to do with, you know, the two exits of, 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 of the human body, and then the, you know, the other aspects of falling asleep, losing consciousness, psychosis, sensual touch, right? Th those things. So if any of those happen, then you have to make wudu again in order to pray. You guys ready to go to the next? Okay. Yes, Grace. Yeah. Yes. No, you could, you could do it. anything that you do afterwards is fine. So you could eat, you could brush your teeth, you could do it. That doesn't invalidate the wudu. You can do it before or after. It wouldn't impact your wudu at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wouldn't say you can't, because I don't want you to think that if you 
pause to brush your teeth for two minutes in between that that would invalidate your wudu? That wouldn't invalidate. Um, but they would just be two separate acts. So if you're in the middle of making wudu and you're rinsing your mouth, and then you pause and you say, I'm, and you brush your teeth in you know, like a minute or two, right? Not a long time. You, you can't take you know, more than like a five to seven minute interruption in the wudu. And then you went back to washing your nose, you know, rinsing your nose, washing your face. That wouldn't invalidate the wudu. Generally, most people will do either do it before or after. They'll just say, okay, wake up in the morning, brush your teeth, and then they make wudu. Or they'll make wudu and then brush their teeth. But the order wouldn't matter. And if you did it in the middle of it, uh, that, that would be fine as well. Yeah, sort of while you're rinsing your mouth. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk about the ritual bath. I'm going to do this in the reverse order. For wudu, we talked about wudu first, and then what necessity, like the, the things that invalidated wudu. Now I'm going to talk about what things were, mean that you need to make a ghusl, or the ritual bath. You need the full bath. And then we'll talk about how to perform that bath. Okay? So there are four things that would necessitate a full body bath. Okay? Two are specific to, to, to women, and they have to do with you know, um, the uterus. And then the other two are common to both men and women. So the first is menstruation. And so when we say menstruation, what we mean is menstruation that ends. So a woman during her menses does not, she's not required to pray. Um, and so she, as long as she has menses, she cannot attain ritual purity in that way. Um, so it's once it ends, right? So I don't want somebody to think that if you have your menses for every prayer, you're making the, the, the bath. No, it's, well, you, you're, you're, um, you're excused from the prayer during the, the menstrual period. Um, and it's also forbidden to have intimacy with, with one spouse in that time. Um, and then you, uh, after the end of, the, of, of a woman's period, and there are different women, women tend to know their bodies if they're older and they've had several periods. Um, if they're a young girl and they don't know, they're, or they're, if they have very irregular periods, that gets a little specific and maybe we, if, if you have specific questions, maybe you can ask later. If you don't feel comfortable asking in front of the group, uh, I'd be happy to try to answer those. But once the period is over, then you would have to take the full bath. And it's the same for postpartum bleeding, right? That a woman, after she gives birth, um, tends to have uh, bleeding for a period, and then when it ends, she would make the bath and, um, in order to be prepared. The second, sorry, the third is um, ejaculation. Um, and the, the fourth is penetration. So both the husband and the wife, and I'm going to assume that these are always lawful right, settings, right, husband and wife being intimate with one another, um, even if um, there is not orgasm and ejaculation, right? And I, I just want to be very clear about these things, so I apologize if people aren't used to discussing these things, but in educational settings, we sort of don't um, use ambiguous terms and euphemisms because somebody might misunderstand. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak directly and clearly. Um, it, if in intimacy, um, husband and wife, there's penetration, even if they, you know, something interrupts them and there is not um, orgasm or ejaculation, that still would necessitate a bath. And then even if there is orgasm and ejaculation without penetration, that necessitates the ritual bath. Okay, so th these are the four things. Um, mm -hmm. Now I want to talk briefly about... Um, Ellen, do we have a copy of Being Muslim here? Would you mind grabbing it for me? I, I want to be able to refer to a page number that you guys can look at later. Um, so with each of these things, so I want you guys again to look at that, this uh, pyramid or the triangle. When you're in a state of minor ritual impurity, there are certain things that are forbidden to do. Right? So it's forbidden to pray if you have minor ritual impurity, right? because you don't have wudu, and you haven't fulfilled the prerequisites. So it would be sort of sacrilege to engage in the prayer without wudu. It would be forbidden to touch a, an all-Arabic copy of the Quran. So if it's in Arabic and English, you can touch it, right? Um, and then, have you guys ever seen people circling the Kaaba in Mecca, right? You need wudu for that, right? So if you don't have wudu, it would be forbidden to do that. But then there are things that, while you're in major ritual impurity, they're also forbidden for you. 
They include everything that's forbidden with minor ritual impurity. Edlin, if you can't find it, don't 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 worry about it. I, I can. Okay. Oh, you do? okay? Yeah. Uh, I just want to be able to give you guys page numbers to refer to. Um, so we break them up in, t in terms of what you cannot do while, you're, while you have a state of major ritual impurity. It depends on the cause. So let's talk about what we'll call the, um, the bleeding. Thank you so much. Sorry to make you walk over. Thank you, Patrick. All right, so... So page 53, just for your reference, um, covers this. And then forty-eight. So just if, if you're taking notes, you can just kind of refer to them. Forty-eight says things that are forbidden in a state of minor ritual impurity. The minor the, the middle level is the prayer, salah, circling the sacred house, the Kaaba, and touching a hard copy of the Quran that is the only the Arabic. Now when we get to major ritual impurity, what's forbidden depends on the cause. So with menstrual bleeding and postpartum bleeding, intimacy is forbidden for both husband and wife. It, it, it would be sinful. Um, and then if you have major ritual impurity that's through intimacy, meaning penetration or ejaculation, right? Then it would become forbidden to recite the Qur'an, right? To recite the Qur'an becomes forbidden. Now, what I mean by that is, so if, because that, 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 those are, that's sacred, that's the, the sacred scripture, that's, that's God's word. So you, it, you can recite it if you have a state of minor ritual impurity. So if we don't have wudu, and I say, hey, let's read the Fatiha, right? Let's practice that, then, then, then you could do that. But if you have major ritual impurity from penetration or ejaculation, you cannot recite the Qur'an. So can a woman who's on her period, can she recite Qur'an? Yes. This is, a, this is the point that I want to get to, right? I, I, I really wish I, I could project this here, right? So think of it like this. There's two main things to think about. Can you recite Quran and can you be intimate? Bleeding says you cannot be intimate during this period. Right? But bleeding does not forbid you from reciting Quran. Uh, penetration and ejaculation forbid you from reciting Quran, but they don't forbid you from being intimate. Right? Which I hope is intuitive. Right? So you, if if you're intimate, you can continue to be, in, you don't have to say, we have to, you know, I, right? So think of those as, as two different, now both of those groups have to perform the ritual bath in order to pray. But when they're in the state of major ritual impurity, they, they, there's different things that are forbidden to them. So if a husband and wife are intimate, then they shouldn't recite Quran until they perform the ritual bath. But if a woman is menstruating, she can recite the Quran. Because it's it's a different cause, yes. Correct, correct. Yes. Yes. Um, God says in the Quran that that's a time that is it's not clean to be uh, intimate with one another. And so, and it's unhealthy as well. And so, God says, "Don't, don't uh, be intimate." Now, when I mean intimate, I mean intercourse, right? Um, husband and wife can still, you know, touch each other, and, you know, like that. I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, sexual intercourse here. What, what would be forbidden? Yeah. And it's not just until the end of the menstruation. It's until she takes uh, a ritual bath, the ghusl. Then it becomes um, permissible. And it's also, I mean, there's a, there's a great mercy in this, right? Many women have pain and discomfort. Many women, I mean, there's like, some women really suffer during their, their menstrual periods. Um, and so they, they don't have to pray. They're excused from the prayer. And then it's also a time in which um, men and women just uh, refrain from intimacy.
Yeah. Yeah, and I can, if you guys have questions that you don't feel comfortable um, asking in front of the brothers, that well, I, can, I can try to answer those, but makeup I just don't have any experience with. Thank God, I don't. Nowadays you have to clarify, right? You got to say, I don't, I don't have any experience with makeup. Go. Yeah, yeah, depending on what the questions are, absolutely. But I'll even make myself available to try to answer a few if they're, if they're straightforward. Yes? Um, so, what would happen? Would you say that you would have mm -hmm. And then if they would have Yeah, the bath. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, then it's just considered that it started again. That would be okay. Um, so you would just sometimes. No. No, because some, some, women, some women have also. Um, Thank you. Also, because some women have um, their period comes in segments, they, they, they will have interruptions. Sometimes for two days, they'll have bleeding for a few days and then it stops for two days and then it comes back and some people have very irregular periods so that that's normal so if she, if she feels like it, the bleeding has stopped she would take her ghusl she'd make the bath she would pray and then maybe a day or two later it resumes again everybody's body is different so then she would she would know how her body is is going and say okay my period is back again or 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 it's gone but but if you happen to to pray having blood but you didn't realize yeah then like, yeah then that's excused yeah okay. yeah anything generally anything that you don't you're unaware of okay you're excused from the perspective of a sin it's not sinful no. you may not be excused from the responsibility so for example let's say we were talking earlier about um, the barrier of water to the skin let's say I was painting because we use that example, and I had a large patch here, and I made wudu, and I prayed, and then the prayer time lapsed, and I prayed two or three prayers. We're all praying together, and somebody says to me, hey, Asad, your arm, you've got a big blotch of paint on that backside that you can't see. I, I'm not in a state of sin that I didn't pray with a proper wudu, but I'll, owe the, I'll have to make up those prayers. My responsibility will still be there. So I'll remove the paint, and I'll wash the arm, and I'll make wudu again, and then I will repeat the prayers that were with a, yeah, a invalid wudu. Oh. So because I didn't know, I'm excused from the, the burden of the sin, but I'm not excused from the responsibility of performing the prayer properly, right? Mm -hmm. So sort of like, I don't know, um, some, you know, I mean, you can kind of think of it that if you didn't know, you, you know, like in the law, you can say, oh, I didn't know that this was a, you know, you get pulled over for speeding. So I didn't realize this was a 40, the, the, the police officer doesn't care. You're going to get that ticket, right? Um, but so it's not like that. You don't have the burden of the sin. But you can sometimes think of maybe uh, like a professor uh, assigns something. Say, oh, I, th I didn't know that, that we had to do that. I thought that was optional. And the teacher says, oh, you know, that's, that's fine. But you still, it, it, it wasn't optional. I won't mark you off for turning it in late, but you still owe it, for example. So maybe something a bit more like that. So you, 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 you wouldn't have the sin, but there are sometimes you can still owe something. Uh, yes. Um, so I understood what you said about um, menstruation and the sort of ex excusal or the excusal from the the salat as a mercy. Yes. But another way to that I'm struggling with that is that you know if if salat we think of it as is an opportunity to connect with God, mm -hmm. right? So in a sense. The not being able to do it for potentially a quarter of your 
you know, menstruating years mm -hmm. um, feels exclusionary. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can just help me think about yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, there's, there are many rulings in the religion that vary by age, vary by even income. They vary by gender. They vary, there's all of these variabilities. Um, and so one of the great mercies from God is I think that he hasn't created one standard for everybody. And he hasn't created one pathway for everybody. Um, and there is actually what, what, what we find is that there are um, different opportunities for everybody. So what do I mean by that? If you think of, so for example, there were some of the um, impoverished companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They said, these people give charity all the time and we can barely feed ourselves. We don't, give to give, we don't get to give charity for the sake of God. They felt excluded. They felt that they didn't have access to this. And then the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, you know, even a smile in your brother's face can be charity, right? Even a removing harm from, from the road can be charity. He expanded people's understandings of what charity is. And what he teaches us through that is that how you deal with the, the, the cards God gives you to not have money, then you have to be patient, you have to be grateful for the little that you have, etc. All of us are going to have different paths. We, I think we like to try to understand some of the, 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 the reasonings that God does things, but the reality is we don't fully understand human nature. I think that there is a, 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 uh, an extent to which when a woman is menstruating, um, to wake up in the morning can be difficult for some people. Um, to stay up late for the night prayer can be difficult for some people. Um, I think that there's still the, dis the, the feeling that, especially if women have a longer period, like a week or longer, that they will start to feel a hunger for the prayer, right? And I, and, and I know this from female relatives, that once they wash, they reconnect with the prayer in a much stronger way. They don't take it for granted the way that the men who are praying all throughout are. So there's, there's something different. Women's bodies, their, their entire, um, is almost has a seasonal, a monthly, like a, a lunar flow to it in which the soul is doing different things at different times. And it's open to different things at different times. Um, so it's not exclusionary in the sense of you, there's many ways to, 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 to grow closer to God. And you can increase in your, 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 your invocation, your dhikr, your dua. There's, there's all of these other things. Um, and, and I think it also allows a woman, once she is praying, that there's a kind of sweetness and an access. I, and I'll give you a small example because I don't, you know, I, I, I guess it has to be said nowadays, but I don't know what it's like to, to, to have a menstrual period. But I have a, a small inkling of what that might be like. I, I had an injury, um, and, I, and, I, and I couldn't pray. I couldn't pray normally. And I remember thinking to myself, if I don't get to prostrate again, I'm gonna, I'm like, I'm gonna lose my mind. Like I, I wanna, I wanna put my four, you know, to pray like this, you know. So if if you have an injury and you can't prostrate on the ground, you just sort of lean. And so when you feel this like deprivation of like, oh God, like I wanna get, I, I really wanna prostrate to you, right? Um, once that happened, and I again, I went for years prostrating, and it just felt very normal. But the deprivation opened me up to an appreciation of something. And as soon as I had enough strength, even my family said, whoa, whoa you're, you're really pushing yourself. I was like, I, you don't understand. I want to put my forehead on the ground. Like, I really want that. And I missed it. And I, and I, and, and I wept the first time, like, after this injury. I said, oh, thank you, Lord. You know, like, if, if, if you took me before I got to do this again, I, I, you know, I, I would have been truly deprived. So in there, God has his wisdoms. We don't, we don't understand everything. But we do know that God doesn't deprive anyone. And he gives people different opportunities and different tests and different ways to grow and different ways to connect. And he knows us best. Um, and although sometimes we can glean some understandings of divine wisdom, in the end, they're, they're human attempts. Um, but there's, you know, what, 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 what I will say is this. It's a very important principle to know that God knows us better than we know ourselves, right? If you think of, 
Anybody here have teenagers? Right? Okay. So you realize that there's this, they, they reach a point where they feel like they know everything, right? And it becomes very hard for them to take advice from somebody who has more life experience. Like, you're going to change your mind about this. If you just, you get another decade or two of life experience, you're going to feel very differently. Um, if that's how it is just with human understanding, right? That 20 years, right? And, and this teenager just really, because they're comparing themselves to how they were when they were 12 or 13, they're like, I've figured life out. I know everything. You can tell I have a teenager at home, right? <laughs> um, you, 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 if, if that, it's, that's how human understanding can change with just life experience. And there's a kind of, if I don't get it, then it can't make sense that the, teen, the teenager feels that way. If I, if, if I don't understand it, then there, there's, if, I, if I don't agree with it, and that's just human understanding. So what, and that's just with the parent. What about the grandparent and that teenager? The number of years and the wisdom, and somebody say, oh, you, you're going to feel differently, or you don't really know what life is like, or you don't know. And so, that, so what about divine wisdom, right, and prophetic wisdom? Um, so I think there, there is a sense in which we can say, let's try to understand divine wisdom, but the reality is we're, we're all just, these are just attempts. Even everything I just shared with you, these are just attempts. God knows what he um, is doing, and, and we know that God, here, here's the thing. I actually think, if, if you want me to be very honest, I think men are spiritually disadvantaged. Like, if, if, if the object is to grow closer to God, and you have to be kind and forgiving, and merciful and compassionate. I think women have an unfair advantage. I really do think so. Um, generally, men will have more temper problems. Would you Would you agree, gentlemen? Generally, they're like, ah, uh, I'm seeing some like, ah, uh, yeah. Depends on the depends on the day, right? But generally, right? Who has um, being being compassionate, right? Being merciful, right? Um, it comes more instinctively and natural to women. So men and women have their own challenges. There are things that men um, come more naturally. And, and again, I, I know nowadays it's, oh, but that's not true. I know a woman. You know, we're talking about human nature as God created it outside of the individual people who have their, their own makeup and their own life experiences. But if we don't see the beauty of the feminine, as different than the masculine, then we lose something. And the beauty of the masculine is different from the masculine. God says in the Quran that he made the, 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 the male and the female as signs of God. So if you don't marvel at the beauty of each, and you say, oh, they're just the same, then, then, then I think you lose something. So, I know that was a really long answer that didn't really answer you. Yes, Edwin. You want to add something? Yeah. And even that variation of what you're focusing on, I think, has an advantage, right? And then whereas men, it's it's just the same. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, there's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he, he says that, that the, that the womb... Uh, was that, that God says I, the, the, my, uh, the, the name for the womb, the word for womb, is derived from my name of the All-Merciful, Ar-Rahman, right? And so whoever severs the ties of the womb, right? Because if you notice, they're not called the ties, right? Kinship ties are called the tie, the bonds of the womb. They're not called the, the bonds of the father or whatever. It's, it's, it's the ties of the womb then uh, God, he, he's severed from God. God severs the, the relationships with him. So definitely there is, and if you think about it, it's the seat of God's creative force in the world. There's something, I mean, woman comes from womb man, like it's the womb, 
right? So there is something definitely um, powerful and there's something special and unique there. Um, and so that's why God has created certain rulings about it. And even medically, we know hormonal change. There's all these things that change in the body. It's, it's something that affects a woman's entire being um, for a period of time. You had a question. Yeah. Yeah, if you do it knowingly, right? Remember how we talked about if you do something unknowingly, you'll be absolved from the sin. But if I know that I don't have wudu and I get up and I perform the prayer, that would be sinful. Invalid, like correct. It would be sinful. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're asking. Why? Because it's like, remember how I was using the analogy for like the Jewish scripture, Old Testament, to enter the temple without proper purification? You just sort of waltz in there, right? And you're like, you know, it's kind of, I mean, we think of it, there's certain settings, certain restaurants you can't eat in without a proper dress code. Or there's, certain, there's a certain, if you don't respect and show the proper respect to the setting of the state of sanctity of the prayer, then that, that's, that, that becomes sacrilege at that point. Now again, we're talking about intentionally. If you thought you made wudu and you had the blob of paint, right, that blotch of paint, that's, that's a different. Um, but yeah, so... It, so if it's the proper the, the, the five time a day proper prayer, if you don't fulfill the, 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 the prerequisites, if you're not in a state of purity, that would be sinful. If you do the dua, like the supplication, you do the dhikr, you do the other things, that wouldn't be sinful. So any even a man who, uh, again, either had intercourse or fell asleep, all, all of these things, anybody who doesn't come to it with its proper respect of, of the ritual purity, that, that would be deemed sinful. And again, intentionally, because we all, everybody has forgotten and made a mistake and things like that. One more question, then I'm going to try to move on for time. Go ahead. No, no, please. That's a really good question. Um, I'm going to come to that, yeah, to use a bidet. So I want to come to that afterwards, because that comes in the, um, you know, number... Two is ritual cleanliness. That's for cleaning the body. So, so, so we're going to come to that. So now we're going to go through the ritual bath. Okay. So the ritual bath, it's called ghusl in Arabic. And again, if you if you don't if you're struggling with the Arabic terms, just the the ritual bath. Um, the ritual bath is anybody who's in a state of major ritual impurity. If they just made wudu, would they be? Would that suffice them? If you have major ritual impurity, no. You need the bath. Right? You guys are looking at that the triangle diagram, right? So to get from the bottom to the top, it requires a bath. So we're going to look at it here. So essentially, uh, you would begin with the intention, right? Let's say you're in the shower. You'd make the intention. You would begin by removing any filth. And we're going to talk about filth shortly, right? But bodily fluids is the easiest way to think of it. You're going to remove uh, bodily fluids, and then you'd wash the private area. And then you would start with the limbs of wudu. So you'd wash the hands, you'd rinse your mouth and nose, you'd wash the face, you'd wash the arms. But instead, right, when you get to the head, if you notice it says wash the head, not wipe it. You'd wash the head three times. This is where water has to penetrate down to the scalp. And the same for the beard. Remember how we said thick beard, thin beard? For the ghusl, you have to, water has to penetrate all the way down to the skin for both the head, everywhere. You have to penetrate the skin. So what happens if a man or a woman has longer hair and it's tied into like a braid? Do you have to undo the braid? The question, the, sorry, the, the, the answer to that question depends on how tight that braid is. So you know sometimes, and I, this is mostly for the women, I've seen like, you know, women can have thick hair and a really thick braid that's so tight that if you put it under a faucet and pulled it out, the middle of the hair would still be dry. It's so... If it's like that, then she has to open up the braid to allow the water. But if it's something that it's a loose braid that it soaks, then she could just soak it in the water, sort of massage it to get all of the water in. You'd wet all of the hair and make sure the hair gets to the scalp. That, that would be enough. She wouldn't have to undo it every time. Okay. Um, so then you'd wash the hair and the head three times. And then you'd wash the rest of the body. So 
For the ghusl, it's literally the entire body. Top of the head to the bottom of the feet is going to get washed, right? So then you'd wash the neck. Sorry, the mic's right here. You're going to wash the neck, the front, the side, the back. You'd get behind your ears, right? You'd wash the chest. And everything that you would do, you'd do right before left. So I'd wash, you know, like right torso and then left torso. The upper arm would get washed, right? I'd get the back. You'd have to get the back. And if you have problems reaching the back, some people either just because of their body size or an injury, sometimes you have a shoulder injury, you can use like a cloth or something or a, uh, a brush to reach back there. And then you wash the back. You'd wash the 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 upper the buttock and upper thigh, right, right and the left, and then the calf, and then the feet last. Now for the feet, you you would get in between the toes now, as a, you, you as, as a as an obligation. Remember I, when I said for wudu, I said it's optional. You can wash between the toes. For the ghusl, head to toe, everything gets washed, all the crevices, okay, and then that would be um, that'd be done. You, you, you'd be done with the bath, yeah. R remind me your name? Nathan. Nathan. If you guys wouldn't mind, every time you ask a question, if you can remind me your name, I, I'd like to try to learn. Yeah, Nathan. Um, for the ritual bath, do you have to say Bismillah? Yes, um, you should. Yes, yeah. Um, but for both of them, if you forget, it would still be valid, but Bismillah brings the blessing to the entire thing. Yeah. Whitney. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna get back to you on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me get back to you on that. Yeah. That's a good question. I just don't know the answer because there's also there. So there's sometimes differing opinions. So I, let, let, let me get back to you on that. I'll sort of research that. So, just to review, we now have talked about wudu, how to make it, what invalidates it, and we talked about what puts you in a state of major ritual impurity, necessitating ghusl, and then how to make the ghusl. Do you guys feel comfortable so far? Maybe not memorized everything, that's okay, but you feel comfortable in terms of you understand it. If you go back home, review this a few times, you'd, you'd feel comfortable? Okay. Um, all right, and then and then maybe what we'll do is we'll I'll, I'll kind of go through a full wudu with you guys. Inshallah. Yes, remind me your name. Katarina. Katarina. Mhm. If you haven't had any of those four things happen, the two types of bleeding and the two sort of intimacy thing, you just take regular shower every day. You wake up, take your regular shower, right? But if the one, one of those four happens, and with the bleeding, it's the end of the bleeding, then you should make an intention and you know. Look, you might take a shower, right? I don't know. Maybe you don't undo a braid in a regular shower. I don't know. Some people don't shampoo. They don't wash their hair with every single shower. Some people do body, you know. Those are just, those are for worldly cleanliness. It's just a wash, right? Um, but if you're doing the ghusl, then this is the proper way to do it. Other showers, you can do however you want. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, because you'd still have to make wudu before you pray. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. But, so here's a good question. So, uh, I need to make, I'm in major ritual impurity, right? And I make, I take the ritual bath, the ghusl, and I'm about to go pray, but then I go and I, and I use the bathroom. What, do I need to do anything? You need to do wudu. That's it, right? It doesn't, it doesn't take you back. Yeah. Okay. Um... Okay, so now we're going to move to, I told you this was like 90% of it was ritual purity, right? Which is wudu and the ritual bath and the reasons that you have to do both of them, okay? So, and again, I, I, I encourage everyone to, to reflect on 
bodily cleanliness before you enter the prayer, this ritual purity before you enter, before you even begin to worship God. What is that a metaphor? What's, what, what is that teaching us? You have to purify yourself before you can come closer to God, right? And that tells us spiritually what we need to do, right? So even, there's many of us, cleaning the body is the easy part. But then we come in and we have jealousy and, and hatred and anger and we have all of these spiritual diseases. The whole point is, if we want to get closer to God, we have to purify ourselves in order to get nearer, okay? So the second thing is the ritual cleanliness. So I want to distinguish here between purity. Purity is the one that has the ritual washings. It's wudu and the ritual bath, the ghusl. Cleanliness has to do with the body. So here's where the distinction is. And I want you guys, if you can look on the third panel, the, the, that bottom part. Ritual impurity versus the physical filth. So when you have a state of ritual impurity, if, if you're looking at me right now, do you, can you tell whether or not I have wudu? Can you tell whether or not I need a ghusl? You can't. It's a status. It's immaterial. It's I perform something and I'm in this state. Now, could you tell if I had clothing that was unclean by looking at me? You could. Could you tell if the area that I'm about to pray on is unclean? You could. Because now we're talking about something that's, there's a substance there. That's what the second category is dealing with. Okay, so ritual cleanliness, so again, third panel, where I'm looking at this middle part here. Ritual cleanliness is that you have absence of filth from the body, on your physical body, clothing, and the area that you're going to pray in. Okay, so what's filth? We're, uh, um, we're going to get to that here shortly. Um, there are substances in, in Islamic law, right, ritual law, that are deemed to be filthy, okay? These substances, if they're on your body, on your clothing, or on the prayer area, you can't pray, okay? That's, I'll use an, e the easy ones are urine and feces. Well, that's why these are, these are impurities, right? Those are very easy. You can imagine, can you pray if, 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 you're, if, you, if you had some on you? No, right? So, what does that mean? To go back to, remind me your name? Bailey's question. After we use the bathroom, after you urinate or defecate, it's very important. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon me, taught us ways in which you ensure that you're clean after you're done. Right? So, for example, after you urinate, particularly for the men, right, there's, there's extra steps that you take to ensure all of the urine is out of the body. Right? Um, and even for men, you would, you would, you would, um, you would um, shake and squeeze the genital to make sure all of the urine is out. And then, it's, and then you'd wash. You'd, you'd use a little water or you'd wipe over it to clean it. And then also with, um, with defecating, with what we commonly call it, you know, number two, right? That you would clean that area. You'd make sure that nothing is still stuck to the body. Um, and it's, and it's, uh, uh, you should use water there as well. Okay? Now, there are uh, instances in which you could use something like toilet paper. Right. Um, so, for example, if uh, if you didn't have access to water, it's always better best to use water. So let's use that. That's why bidets and hoses. I mean, if you go into the bathroom here, there's always water sources available. In Muslim culture, even if they're in the middle of the desert, they, they try to secure water sources to wash. Um, and I, it's something I've always found very interesting is like people are obsessed with keeping babies clean. Like there's wipes, there's all there's like tons of devices you can get to make sure. Once a baby uses the bathroom, that they're clean as a, as a whistle. And then as adults, it's, it's something that we become lax in. Um, and one of the things that we believe is that demonic forces, that demons are actually drawn to filth. And, and, and so if you don't clean properly, right, um, then, then you, you can invite those, those uh, sort of satanic forces around. And, and angelic forces, in turn, are drawn, drawn towards cleanliness and, and beautiful smells. That's why the mosque is always kept very clean, and they'll perfume it, and they'll do all of these things. That's why perfume is such a, um, a, a big custom, and, and, and it's, it's a practice of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So these things are, I think, a large part of um, how we understand filth. So 
these substances should be cleaned um, when uh, after using the bathroom. If if one were, and I'm going to get a little detailed here, so I apologize if this is a lot to take in, but um, if a man, if if a, if if a person defecates, right, um, has a bowel movement, and it's not like wet diarrhea that's spread everywhere. If they don't have water, it's, it's sufficient to, to, to wipe with a dry substance like toilet paper. It's better to use the water, but if they don't have that, you, as, as long as it's dry and has it spread beyond that opening. Um, and, uh, however, if it's spread or it's loose or something like that, then you, you, ha you have to wash that area. Um, and then for women, when they urinate, they should always use water. Men, when they urinate because of the difference in the anatomy, they can use a dry wipe. Again, you still should always use water if, if available. Um, very common to see Muslims sort of like at work kind of keep a bottle that they use to take to the bathroom, right? Um, but yeah, it's just water is fortunately very available, especially in a bathroom, right? Um, we're not using outhouses that are like very far away from a water source, so this is um, fortunately something much easier to do. So if filth, get, so we're, we talk now about cleaning yourself after using the bathroom. But if filth gets on the body, so there's other substances that are deemed ritually impure, right? So beyond urine and feces, blood, pus, vomit. I mean, you can kind of just, you can sort of understand, you don't, yeah, you, you can tell what, what would be ritually impure. But what isn't um, is something like mud. We might be out in the yard working and get muddy, right? And have somebody say, oh, don't, don't you bring those filthy shoes in here. But that's not, you can still pray in that because that's pure, right? So we might see it as dirty in, uh, in a sort of purely worldly sense, but it's not impure in a ritual sense. So a man who's a farmer and he's in some like rice paddy field or a woman who's, you know, what, whatever it might be, um, they, they would be, they can pray in that. They don't have to sort of get all of that off. Okay, so you have to make sure that your clothes are clean, your body is clean, and the immediate area that you're praying in um, is also clean. And so if you, if, you, if you have a piece of clothing that's soiled, or an area that's soiled with some kind of filth, blood, or pus, or vomit, all, all these gross things, you, do, you wash it with water, or you can throw it in the washing machine, right? And, and that suffices, that, and that, becomes, that becomes pure again. The third is facing towards Mecca. That one is pretty easy, I hope, right? So, yes, Katarina. Yes. Yes, correct. Yeah, cleaning with water only makes your body clean. It's removing the filth. That's number two, that you have the cleanliness. But you don't have ritual purity, right? That's a very good question. So these are two different areas. Think of one as the ritual purity status, that triangle. And the other is looking at your body, something somebody else can see. All right. So facing towards Mecca. What this means is that your chest is facing towards Mecca, right? If you're off by a little bit, right, such that if you, if you could imagine the direction of Mecca is here, if I'm off by a little bit, it's still valid. Um, but if I find out if my back is towards Mecca, that would be invalid. Okay? Um. Okay. And then the last is covering the body, the fourth. Covering the body is something that differs for men and women. There is um, a minimum that should be covered inside the prayer, which is different than what has to be covered outside of the prayer, for example. Um, so, for, uh, so for men, the minimum that must be covered um, is, and this is what must be covered. So it's recommended to cover the, the shoulders and the torso for men, but the minimum would be from the navel to above the knees. Um, and again, for you know, we also have to think about, this is for like all times, all cultures, all, we're talking about, you know, again, people in the pre-modern world who sometimes they didn't have a lot of clothing and working outside and, you know, 
So having shirts off was something that was very common if people were working. Um, so that's the minimum. Although it, it, it's a dislike to pray without covering the shoulders and the torso for a man, but it still would be valid. For a woman, she would cover also the hair, the head. Um, the face would be exposed and the hands would be exposed. Um, and then um, uh, the feet can also be exposed. Okay, although there's kind of a difference of opinion. So, um, um, and so you would cover that, and that those that those clothes would have to be clean. So we're talking about clean clothes. Um, and so if we did all four things, right? So we made wudu, that's one. Then we face Mecca. We are covered. Our nakedness is covered. We're appropriately covered. Um, and then our clothing. Our bodies and our prayer area are clean. We've gotten those four. We're now ready to enter the prayer. Okay, so that's the preparation for the prayer. We're done with that. All right. Um, we'll take questions for a few minutes, and then I kind of want to take a stretch break. You guys up for a stretch break? And then we'll, we'll dive into the prayer, inshallah. Remind me your name? Chad. Chad. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it would be disliked, but it would still be valid. So again, we're talking about like, if you're at home, I really don't think you have an excuse for praying without a shirt, right? Just generally, I think even nowadays. But we're talking about if someone, um, like I said, you know, some labor in a rural part of some, you know, where it's very customary, um, that, that would be okay. Again, that person, actually what, what, what is common in Muslim cultures, even in those societies, if somebody was a laborer outside doing it, is they still would have a prayer shirt that they would bring. So they, they had a shirt. And they would still do that. If they didn't have that, it would still be a valid prayer. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Daisy. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would just say try your best, but a little bit showing doesn't invalidate the prayer. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah. So just, I, you know, I think it's one of those things that you try to strike a balance between don't blow it off, right? So you're still trying, and then you kind of don't have to, to um, overly concern yourself with that. Um, but the scholars do talk about small amounts showing, you know, are, are okay. Um, the areas that are sort of more sensitive, you just make sure those are covered, right? But I mean, even if you think of, um, it's like a woman's hair might show this much in the prayer. Does that, like, you know, she just, the way she put her scarf, does that mean the prayer is invalid? No, right? It's just these, you know, she's covering her hair. It's just, it's a little imperfect. So these things, you know, one of the things I always say is, you know, God is not like the IRS, right? All right. Yes, Katarina. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You should cover the neck. Yeah, you should cover the neck. Yeah. So uh, we'll take a five minute stretch break and then I'm, I want a, a show of hands. So knowing how to perform the prayer is relatively easy. I mean, I, you know, I, it will take time, but you'll get there. I would say the hardest aspect of it is the memorization component, particularly if you're not familiar with the Arabic. So today, the 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 Fatiha. Does every, do you guys know what the Fatiha is? The opening chapter of the Quran. Okay. So the Fatiha is the first chapter of the Quran. If you open up your cards, it's the. Uh, if you go to the blue side, it's the leftmost uh, uh, page here. The recitation. It's chapter one, the opening. That is an, an essential part of the prayer to, to memorize. So we've got some volunteers today to try. We're going to break up into groups. If you want some help memorizing and pronouncing, you may not get it memorized today, um, but we're going to try to, you know, instead of just doing pure theory, we said, well, let's break up and maybe do some help with people to, to, to do um, memorization. So I'm going to ask if you guys are comfortable, and I, I really i am sorry to keep putting you guys on the spot, who's, who... Who would like help with memorizing the Fatiha? Show of hands. One, two, four, five, six. Okay. So, 
Okay. Let me maybe ask the question in the reverse. Who's who would say I don't I don't need any help. I really feel very comfortable with it. Okay. 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 So we'll break up into groups. If you feel comfortable, I think we have volunteers. Maybe still sit in a group and, and, and you can sort of benefit from review or maybe you can be with somebody that helps others. But do you guys think this would be a helpful exercise to break up and, and learn the fatah? The other recitations you can learn over time, but the fatiha is sort of the, 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 the backbone of, of the prayer unit. So we'll take a five minute break and then we'll, start, we'll, we'll reconvene, we'll break up into groups and then we'll, uh, we'll continue the class and finish the prayer. Did you have a question? I would say I think it's good to learn the meaning in English, to just be familiar, to really know the meaning in English. I wouldn't worry about memorizing the meaning in English and perfecting the recitation in English. I think that energy would be better utilized to memorize the Arabic because the Arabic, when you first start, the Arabic will just, you, you won't know what you're memorizing. Right? And you'll start off trying to sort of get there. Um, but, and again, this is part of, remember how we started off the conversation? Part of the miracle of the prayer is that you can walk into a mosque in China, Kenya, Turkey, anywhere, and, and pray together in the same way. We have preserved, this is God's words, right? This is divine speech. You will start to understand it you will develop an understanding of the word. So it's good to learn the meaning in English, but in terms of memorization, to memorize Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, like that's divine speech. That came from God to Gabriel, Gabriel to the Prophet Muhammad. Like, so to learn those words, and over time you'll say, uh, those, they start off perhaps maybe sounding like sounds at first, and then after a while you'll start to work out Alhamd, that means praise. Oh, I, remember, I know that the opening, the first verse means Praise be to God, the Lord of all the worlds. So, alhamdulillah. Oh, alhamdulillah. I've heard Muslims say that phrase. And you'll, you'll, I guarantee it'll start to expand the depth of its meaning. Um, so, I think it's a, it's a great piece of advice to learn the meaning. But in terms of memorization, I think it's, it's more important to memorize it in Arabic. Yeah. Okay, let's break. <clears throat> so, I'm going to do uh, the wudu um, just to demonstrate it. And, uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll talk through it as I do it, and I'll just remind you guys of some of the details. Um, and then at the end of it, I'll review with you guys um, what aspects that if forgotten are okay and which ones, if you forget, are not okay. Um, I told you guys I'd give you the page number in the book. Um, so it's 48. Thank you. Mm. 53 maybe? Yeah. Uh, hold on. Yeah, 51. It's on page 51, sorry. Yeah, page 51. Okay, so inshallah we will begin. Um, so, what's the first thing I'm going to do? Tension, right? So I'm going to intend that I intend to make wudu in order to pray, in order to read the Quran, do something like that. Uh, Bismillah, right? And I'm going to use water. Um, so this is about half a liter of water. I'm going to just try to do it all in here since we're on carpet. All right. So I'm going to start by washing my hands three times, right? up to and including the wrists, right? Okay, now rinsing the mouth three times. Right, swishing around. Use your finger almost like a toothbrush to, to clean. And then now I'm going to do the rinsing the nose. Sorry, it's a strange sound to have on a microphone. Mm. 
Okay. Now I'm going to wash my face three times. And washing, not wiping, right? So I'm going to go from the top of the head. So I gather the water. So my facial hair is thin, so I comb through it with my fingertips. Get it all the way down. Under the bridge of the nose. Okay. I'm going to wash my right arm, fingertips to elbow, right? So I'm going to run the water down. You see how I cupped it, right? I'm going to go all the way around. And if you remember, I'm going to go through all of the fingers, right? Right. And this is more of a technique thing. You can get the water onto the arm however you like, but if you pour yourself just a, a handful, and just let it pour down by lifting your hand up. Right? I'm interlacing the fingers, getting the webs, the fingernails, up to and including the elbow. And then what's next? Head wipe. Beautiful. Nathan's with me here. All right. So, right, head wipe. I'm getting the water in my hands. I let the water just simply fall off. I'm going to put my thumbs up and my fingertips together like this. And you can see I'm getting my whole head, right, all the way to the back, the nape. And I'm going to do that return wipe. Okay. I'm just putting my head, my hair back in place somewhat. It's not. Part of the wipe. So one wipe, okay? And I wet my fingers again. I'm wiping my ears. One wipe. I'm going to do my feet. I tend to just pour it directly on. One scoopful. Um, that's a great question. Um, both. So these here, the thumbs go on the back side, and the um, four fingers on the front. So, and then going in between the toes is recommended, right? You can do it with your index finger, you can do it with your pointing finger. But I'm making sure I'm getting this underneath side that is kind of like not always visible. Okay. Oops. Underneath the tips of the toes. Okay. And then remember we talked about you finish by saying the Shadu and Allah from the Rasulullah. There's other du'as you can say, other prayers, supplications. But that's essentially it. And, you know, it's less than, when you're not using a faucet, it takes very little water. And it's actually recommended to minimize the water, that you don't waste water. You do. So, I sometimes have a small, um, like, pot for my wudu. Um, I don't use it every time, but it's nice even in a, in a sink, that if you just fill it up and you're sort of more... I'm conscious of, of your water use. That was some, the son of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said, you can even be wasteful with water on a river, uh, you know, on the river bank, making wudu that you don't waste water. That's it. Any questions? Right? Very straightforward. Okay. All right. So I think we're going to go pray Luhur, and then we'll come back. Yes, please.
Yes, if you you have to make the intention, and then you have to make sure you wash the limbs of wudu. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah. Yes. 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 Inshallah. Well, I'll go. Okay. So the so the, the schedule now it's twelve forty five. We're gonna make wudu, pray. We'll have lunch, and then we're gonna come back. Um, Okay, I think we're a little tight on time. Let me let me show a hands. Who could stretch till two fifteen, if if we if we had to. Okay, if not, inshallah, this will be recorded for for that. But okay, but I, I really I'd rather go at the pace that you guys need and not just kind of blast through it. Um, yeah. All right. Bismillah. Sorry. I also I just had a recent surgery, so it's like hard for me to even balance all of this. So, but I hope that was helpful. If you haven't seen it, um, that's essentially inshallah how it is. All right. So, um, I am sorry to report that we're a little behind schedule in terms of the content that we're covering. So I'm going to um, maybe ask that let's hold the questions for a bit. Let me get through it and then I'll pause at the end and try to do questions sort of in, in, in one segment, um, if that's okay. So, Bismillah. So, so now we know how to prepare for the prayer. So now we're going to focus on the prayer. So the prayer itself um, is composed of units, okay? So it's called a raka'ah in Arabic. But if you think of the prayer unit, if you know how to do a prayer unit, a prayer is just a repetition of the prayer unit with slight variations, okay? So um, if you learn that pattern, then you simply need to know this prayer, how many prayer units is it? And then if you know how the variations work, it becomes relatively easy to figure out how to perform the prayer. So let's talk about um, the prayer unit, what goes into a prayer unit. So first, after you've done all of the preparation that we talked about, so you have wudu, you are clean in your clothes, in your prayer area, etc., and you're facing the direction of Mecca, right, um, and you're covered appropriately, then you'll start with Allahu Akbar. Right, which means God is greater or God is the greatest. So Allah, you'd raise your hands sort of shoulder height and you'd say Allahu Akbar. Okay, and you can see in our diagram, we'll look at the two prayer sequence just as, as the example. But you can see to enter the prayer is you raise your hands to about shoulder height or just above the shoulders and you say Allahu Akbar. That statement Allahu Akbar enters you into the state of sanctification. Right, it's you're in a you're in a, uh, in a, in a, in a inviolable state, a state where you can't talk, you can't eat, you can't do anything that's external to the prayer, um, other than sort of minimal movements, right? Um, so you have to have the intention for the prayer before you say Allahu Akbar. So like any other ritual we said, you begin with the intention, you face the direction of Mecca, and you say Allahu Akbar, okay? And then you enter the prayer. The prayer unit itself is composed of, you're in the standing position, right? That's where you say Allahu Akbar is from the standing position. You can't do it from any other position. You can only enter the prayer, you know, unless you have an injury or you're hurt, right? If you're healthy, you're in the standing position, you say Allahu Akbar. In that standing position, you would recite the Fatiha, right? The opening chapter that we just reviewed together, okay? Um, and then if you guys still need help with that, I suggest that you get the numbers of whoever was helping you or of one another. But really, I, it's important that you get that Fatiha um, uh, memorized. So you'd stand and you'd recite the Fatiha. Now in that standing position, there's different positions you can hold your hands. The most common is to fold over um, the, the, the abdomen for the men, for the ladies over the chest. But those are just slight variations. Above the navel, below the navel, there's all of these. Uh, minor things, um, but you uh, in that position you recite the Fatiha. Then you're going to transition to the next position, which is the bowing position. So you can see that number three on our on our card. Um, that's the bowing position. So in order to transition, you would say Allahu Akbar again. Okay, so you're in the sanctified state. All transitions save one. You would say you'll say Allahu Akbar for that transition. Okay, so Allahu Akbar. And then there is, you can, if you look at number three on the, the legend under the picture, do you guys see this chart? 
So in number three, it tells you, you would say, Subhana Rabbil Azim, three times. Okay, that's what you would say there. Subhana Rabbil Azim, three times. And then you would rise, if you look at the arrow, to go from bowing back to standing. You would say, Sami'allahu liman hamida. That's a longer one. If you're not familiar with it, that's okay. But just know that's the only one that's not Allahu Akbar. Okay? You would say, Sami'allahu liman hamida. If you don't know that, if you don't uh, memorize that, that's okay. You can just, you can just rise out of it. Okay? Until, until you learn it. I'm telling you what the goal is. And then wherever you are, you just do the best that you can. The most important one to do is the Fatiha and then the positions. All of the other invocations you can learn, inshallah. Okay? Then you're going to, when you're saying, after you say, Sami Allah and Hamida, you're back to the standing position. Okay? Um, and then number four is that standing position. And the, you would say, Rabbana lak alhamd. So when you say, Allah and Hamida, that means God hears the one who praises him. And then so you'd say, O oh Lord, to you is all praise. Okay? And then from that standing position, you would say Allahu Akbar to transition. That transition is an Allahu Akbar to go into the prostration, the prostrating position. Prostration. Number five. Right? Are you guys following on the on the diagram? Number five. There you would say, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, transcendent is my Lord the Most High, three times. Again, you can work your way towards this. I'm just telling you what it would be. And then Allahu Akbar, you'd come into what's called the sitting position. And then you would go Allahu Akbar into a second prostration. That's the prayer unit. Okay? So standing with Fatiha, bowing, standing again, prostrating, sitting, prostrating. That is the prayer unit. And then you have to have the Fatiha for every prayer unit. Okay? Now, that's the basic and foundational prayer unit. Based on which prayer that it, which prayer unit you're in in the prayer, there will be additions and variations. So you guys got the, the baseline, right? So you're going to enter the prayer. That, that you have to, to, to get in the prayer. Allahu Akbar. Then you're standing with Fatiha. You're going to recite the Fatiha. Then you're going to say Allahu Akbar into the bowing position. You'll say the invocation there. You'll say, Sami Allah in Hamida. Right? Back to stand up. Then you say, Allahu Akbar, to go back to prostrate. Right? You'll say the invocation there. Allahu Akbar, to sit. Allahu Akbar, to prostrate again. Okay? That's one prayer unit. Now, prayers are typically, especially the obligatory prayers, are either two, three, or four prayer units. There's not a five unit prayer that's obligatory. There's, not a, there's no five unit prayers. And there's no one unit prayer that's obligatory. There's, there are two, three, or four. So now we're going to come to the variations in the prayer. Okay? Now if you have the book, the book is, is more helpful to focus on the variations. We don't have a separate segment on the, on the cheat sheet. The variations are essentially three types. Okay? The first is, if it's the first two units of a prayer, which for a two-unit prayer means the whole prayer, both, both of them. If it's three, it means the first two but not the third. And if it's four, it means the first two but not the third and fourth, right? And those first two, you would recite an extra chapter of the Qur'an after the Fatiha, right? So you're going to stand, you're going to say the Fatiha, and it's recommended you should add an additional short chapter. If you look in this recitations, there are two short chapters under the Fatiha that you can memorize. These are the shortest and the easiest, at least to sort of get you um, able to recite those. Okay? So the first variation is if it's the first two prayer units of a prayer, you'll recite an additional chapter of the Quran. Okay. Variation number, is everybody with me so far? Okay, variation number two is if it's the second prayer unit of a prayer, after that, so do me a favor, can everybody look at the three prayer unit sequence on the card? The three, the three unit? In the second prayer unit, 
after you come up from prostration, you go to a seating position. You don't, you don't rise to the next rakaya. You stay seated in between the second and third prayer units. Is that clear to everybody? Okay. So, first prayer unit, as soon as you're done prostrating, you just stand up and you start the second. But then when you pray the second, when you're done with the second prostration, you don't stand up to the third, you sit in between. And there's an invocation there that you will recite. You'll see there it's number seven. So if you go to the, the legend, number seven is a testimonial invocation. And there that is, Tahiyatullah, Zakiyatullah. You can memorize that. The prayer will be valid if you don't memorize this yet and you're still working on it. So you can just sit in the position um, and just you can just say the Shahada, right? And, 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 and hopefully that, that will be good because it ends in the Shahada, okay? The final, the third variation is if it's the last prayer unit of a prayer. So either the second unit of a two unit prayer, the third of a third, three, and then the fourth of a four unit prayer. That one, you rise out of the seating position, the, the, the prostration position, sorry, and you go into the final sitting. You stay in the sitting and you will conclude the prayer, you end the prayer from the sitting position. Okay, now at each of these, you see the numbers underneath. It will tell you what you're supposed to recite. For the final sitting, you'll recite that testimonial invocation, and you'll add the Abrahamic prayer. So you're going to recite two. For the middle sitting, the one that's after the second, in between the second and third prayer units, that one, it's only the testimonial invocation. Are you guys following? can get a little tricky when you do it a few times it becomes I mean I hate stuff but I hate to compare it to like a game right but you know when you learn a game for the first time like you kind of learn and then you just kind of okay let's do a couple practice rounds and then it's it's very easy it, 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 things become easier with practice right but if it's the final sitting the final prayer unit like the third in the three unit and the fourth in the fourth unit the fourth and the four unit, you come out of prostration and you sit. You're going to recite both the testimonial invocation and the Abrahamic prayer. Okay? And then you're going to conclude the prayer by saying Assalamu Alaikum. The same greeting that we give, right? You can turn your head and it says Assalamu Alaikum. Some people add Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, Assalamu Alaikum. You don't have to worry about those. Just Assalamu Alaikum is sufficient, right? And that ends the prayer. You turn to the right and you say it once. And then you turn to the left and say it once. Okay? So right now I just want to focus on the mechanics for a moment. Does everybody understand the makeup of the basic prayer unit? So we're going to begin the prayer facing Mecca, raising my hands above the shoulder. Allahu Akbar. Right? Then let's talk about the basic prayer unit. Fatiha in the standing position. Allahu Akbar. I go to the bowing position. I say the invocation there. I'm not going to say the invocations because I don't want you to focus on them. Just understand the flow, and then you have the invocations you can memorize. So then you're in the bowing position. You're going to say the invocation there. Then you're going to say, Sami Allah ibn Hamida. You're going to stand up again. You say that invocation there. Then you go to the prostrating position. Invocation, sit. The invocations, prostrate. That's the basic prayer unit. Okay. Now, let's go through the three variations one more time. The first is if it's the first two units, after the Fatiha, you're going to add a short passage of the Qur'an. Okay? The second is if it's the second prayer unit, after you're done, at the end of the prayer unit, after the, you do that prostration, you don't stand up to get into the third. You'll stay for what's called the middle sitting. And in the middle sitting, you'll recite the testimonial invocation. That's this box here. Do you guys all see where the testimonial invocation is? Okay, that you would recite that for what's called the middle sitting. It's the end of the second prayer unit and something that's more than two prayer units. Okay, and then the third variation is in the final prayer unit. To end the prayer, you'll come out of prostration and you'll recite both the testimonial invocation and the Abrahamic prayer. And then you conclude with the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Yes. Please, yeah. Mm 
Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I would say I, that's 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 definitely very useful. I would say don't worry about the. There's a reason I'm saying the invocations. I would say that if if you can get to the point where you can learn the Fatiha, right? I would say there just to be present with God in the stand because. These positions have a, have a, they're divinely revealed, right? In fact, we're told in the Quran that there, there are angels that stand glorifying God for eons. There are angels that are in the bowing position to glorify God for eons. And then there are those in the prostrating position. All of these have a special way of glorifying God. If you're simply, if, even if you don't know the, let's say you don't even know where you put the card. You don't know the invocations. If you simply stand with humility before God and then bow in humility before God and you know there's benefit in that that will that will suffice you as a prayer if you have wudu and you say the fatiha and you and, and you do those things inshallah that 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 will be a valid prayer but definitely I, I I would agree with you that's still important to engage in those things but I would also say don't underestimate um, the power of these positions if you have presence of heart. If you have presence of heart, it doesn't matter if you don't remember what you say. If you just, God knows your heart, and if you just, you're present, you're present with humility and awe and reverence, and you simply do those things, that, that, that will be, a, and then you can gradually learn one invocation, add that in, learn a second, learn a third, you'll, you'll have time. Um, but, but I think that's, that's the important part. These, that, that'll create the basic building blocks. Okay. So what I want to do now, if everybody can open your card for me, and we'll do the two prayer sequence, the three and the four. We'll do a quick run through. Okay. So in a two-unit prayer, for all of them, you're going to enter the prayer. Do you guys see how that's the first? That's the first thing that you do. You're standing. You're facing Mecca. You have wudu. You're probably you're properly clothed, and you're in a clean area with clean clothes, and you say Allahu Akbar. To enter the prayer. Then, if you see the one and the two, because it's a two-unit prayer, it's the first two units, you'll recite the Fatiha and an additional chapter of the Quran, right? Because that's variation number one, was an additional chapter in the first two prayer units. And then you say, Allahu Akbar, you're going to transition into the bowing position. There's number three, there's an invocation for that. Then you're going to rise back up to the standing position. Number four, there's its invocation. Then you're going to go from standing down into prostration. Right? In prostration, there's an invocation you're going to say three times. There it is, number five. And then you're going to say, Allahu Akbar. Each transition, you're going to say, Allahu Akbar. Right? And Allahu Akbar, you're going to come to a seating position. And there's a prayer you can say there. And then you're going to go back into prostration. And there's the invocation. Now, because this is the first unit, do we stay sitting or do we rise for the second? We're going to rise for the second, right? And then again, Fatiha, while standing, an additional chapter, Allahu Akbar bow, go back to the standing, Allahu Akbar prostrate, Allahu Akbar sitting, Allahu Akbar prostration. Now this is the final prayer unit of the prayer. So when you come up from prostration, you're going to go into the seating position and you're going to recite seven and eight, the testimonial invocation, and the Abrahamic prayer, which are on the card as well, right? So you're going to recite both of those, right? And you can have it like you can, and as you're praying, you can, you can hold that, right? And, and, and look at it, right? You can recite both of those, and then when you're done, Assalamu alaikum to end the prayer. Or Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Either one is fine. Let's run through the three unit prayer. You guys with me? Yeah? All right. So, Allahu Akbar, you enter the sanctified state. It's the first two prayer units, so it'll be Fatiha and an additional chapter. Allahu Akbar, bow. Rise with the Sami'a Allahin min Hamida. Allahu Akbar into prostration. 
the invocation there. Allahu Akbar into the seating position. Allahu Akbar back into prostration. It's the first unit, so you're going to stand back up for the cycle. Again, you're going to say Fatiha, you're going to add a surah, you're going to add a chapter of the Quran, and then you're going to say Allahu Akbar to go into the bowing position, say that invocation. You're going to rise with the invocation, Allahu Akbar from standing back into prostration, the invocation there, Allahu Akbar to sit, Allahu Akbar to prostrate again, and then this is the second prayer unit, So, but it's not but it's longer than two prayer units, so this is not the final sitting. This is what we would call the middle sitting. So you'd come up into a seated position, and you would just recite the testimonial invocation. And then you're going to rise up again for the third and final prayer unit. Fatiha only, right? No extra chapter. Right? You guys follow that? You see that? So you see how there's only number one under that? That's only Fatiha. And then Allahu Akbar. You go into the uh, bowing position, then you rise standing again, Allahu Akbar prostrate, Allahu Akbar sitting, Allahu Akbar prostrate, and then it's the final, the third out of the th three uh, unit sequence, you're going to come to the final seating position, testimonial invocation, and the Abrahamic prayer, Assalamu Alaikum, and you're done. Right? Four, four. I know this seems redundant, but this, this helps to sort of really reinforce it. You're going to enter the prayer. First two prayer units, it's going to be Fatiha and an additional chapter, right? Run through this in your mind. If you feel like you already know this well, just imagine yourself what would you do next. Try to be one step ahead of us. Allahu Akbar in the bowing position. The invocation there. You would rise with the invocation. You're standing. Okay? Allahu Akbar, prostrate with the invocation. Allahu Akbar sitting. Allahu Akbar, prostrate. And all of the numbers there are to point you to which invocations, okay? Then you'd stand back up for your second prayer unit. Okay? And then, because it's the first two, you would recite Fatiha, and then you're going to add an additional short chapter. And then, Allahu Akbar, into the bowing position. And then you're going to rise back up in the standing position. And then, Allahu Akbar, to prostrate. Allahu Akbar, back to sitting. Allahu Akbar, back to the prostrated position. Okay? This is the second in a longer than two unit prayer, so you're going to sit, you're going to come out of the second prostration to the middle sitting. What are you going to recite there? The testimonial invocation, right? Then from there, because it's four units, you're going to rise, Allahu Akbar. You're going to rise back to the third. Oh, we have a typo here, guys. I'm glad we caught this. So third and fourth rakah should not have a one plus two, just a one. Okay? So, if you have a pen, I, 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 I would mark that off. Mm -hmm. Okay, just one in the third and fourth prayer units. Okay, so just one, and then you would go into the bowing position, stand, Allahu Akbar prostrate, Allahu Akbar seated, Allahu Akbar prostrate. Then there's the fourth rakah, so you're going to go from that prostrated position back to standing for the next prayer unit. In standing, you're going to recite only the Fatiha, because it's the third and fourth, right? Then Allahu Akbar to, to um, the bowing position. Then you're going to rise standing. Allahu Akbar into prostration. Allahu Akbar into sitting. Allahu Akbar prostration. Then you're going to rise for that final seating. You're going to recite the testimonial invocation and the Abrahamic prayer. Okay? And then you'll end the prayer with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. Assalamu Alaikum, sorry, is enough. Okay? Questions? Yes? They were taught to us by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, it's interesting because I, I recently learned of a verse in the Bible that uh, I believe. Yeah, I believe it's in the Old Testament. That blessed is the nation that blesses Abraham. Um, and uh, I, that's not the direct quote, but that's, that's, that was the meaning. Is the, 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 the nation that blesses Abraham uh, will be a blessed nation. And it's interesting because I don't think that, you know, I don't know of in the Jewish tradition or the Christian tradition a specific prayer to bless Abraham. Um, but, with the, but we were taught by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
the testimonial invocation. And the meanings are also in the book. So if you look in the book, being Muslim, it's important to, to, to know the meanings. But they're glorifications of God. Um, they're praising of him. Um, and, uh, and then testifying to his oneness and to the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And then the Abrahamic prayer is a prayer on Abraham and then the Prophet Muhammad um, in that sequence. All of the contents of the prayer were taught to us by the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah. Yes, I love it. Yeah, so, yes, that's, that's, that's very important. We're coming to that next. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you're saying you're, when your feet are off to the side, it's painful. What about when they're just sort of in the middle? Is that more comfortable? Yeah, as long as your feet are tucked under you. Um, yeah, in the diagram, if you look at number six, it's just sort of tucked to the back. They're not off to one side. Um, so it's kind of as you develop flexibility sometimes. If it's uncomfortable, it'll, it's going to distract you from the prayer. So you can kind of um, just do, do what your body can do. Yeah. Um, all right, so the next thing... Um, is we're going to talk about the five prayers. So now we know how to do a two-unit prayer, a three-unit prayer, a four-unit prayer, sort of in the abstract sense. Now we're going to talk about the five prayers. Okay? So there are five prayer times, and each prayer has a fixed duration uh, and time frame. Right? So sorry, when I say duration, I mean like length, how many prayer units it is, and then duration of time, the window of time during which you should pray. And then the third aspect, so I want everybody to look at this, this um, panel here, the one that has times of the prayer, okay? So if you look at the first one listed, it says Fajr, right? That's the, the break of dawn. That's a two-unit prayer. Um, it, it's when dawn breaks, when the first light on the horizon appears um, until the beginning of sunrise, as soon as the disk of the sun touches the horizon, so... That's about a little over an hour of time, typically. Um, but it's, it's early. It's, it's, it's before sunrise. Um, now, if you look, there's an asterisk next to the name Fajr. And there's an asterisk next to the name Maghrib. We'll talk about each of these. And Aisha, this one is the recitation only in the first two prayer units. The recitation of the Qur'an is allowed. The Fatiha and the extra chapter should be allowed. Now, what does it mean to be allowed? Just that you hear yourself. Like me saying, like, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, ar It doesn't have to be loud, but it just means it's not to myself. Like, there's a difference between this and Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman. Even if you guys, if somebody next to me can make it out, but somebody a little further cannot, that's still out loud. Okay? So Fajr is allowed in, in, the, in its two prayer units, right? Um, and the beginning of the time is when the entrance of dawn until the beginning of sunrise. The next prayer is called Dhuhr. That's the midday prayer, okay? And after the sun, so the sun rises and it reaches what's called the zenith or high noon, right? And as soon, soon as it begins its descent, that's the beginning of Dhuhr time. Now, obviously... Summer months and winter months, these will vary quite a bit in terms of the length of the day and what time that is, okay? That's one of the, the beauties of the prayer is it actually connects us to the harmony of nature. Artificial light has changed the way that we, yeah, just changed a lot of things. So this, this helps us to, to reconnect. And the prayer time ends when if you took a, if you were on the equator and you put an object and the shadow of the object became the length, its exact height, then that would be the end of the dhuhr time and the beginning of the next prayer. So dhuhr has no asterisk next to it, as you can see. So all four prayer units are silent. It's four prayer units. They're all silent. And you would um, pray them the way that we talked about the four prayer units. The next one is asr, which means afternoon, the afternoon prayer. 
And it's, it begins when the shadow of an object is equal to its length, and it ends just as the sun is going to touch the horizon. You have to get it done before then. Okay? The fourth is called Maghrib, which means sunset, and it's when the disk of the sun is completely under the horizon. So not when it starts, well, not when it's on the horizon, not when it touches, it has to go completely beneath the horizon. And it goes on until the red twilight of the sky disappears. All right, it's about less than an hour, typically. Again, it depends if it's summer or winter. Um, there's an asterisk. So the first two prayer units, the Qur'an recitation, the Fatiha, and the additional chapter are, they're what? Out loud. Perfect. All right? And then the next one is Isha, which is four prayer units, the first two of which are out loud. The second two are silent, um, and that uh, basically goes from when the red twilight disappears. Um, I mean, you should pray before the middle of the night, midnight, um, but it's technically, you can pray it until the break of dawn. Okay? So these are the five prayers. You should just know the duration, the length, sorry, is it two units, three units, or four? And then is it allowed or silent? A very easy rule of thumb is this. If it's bright outside, it's silent. If it's dark outside, it's allowed. The way that I remember this is so you don't bump into someone praying, they're reciting out loud. That's just my new mind. I don't, that's not why it is. I don't know that that's why it is. But I think about it, if it's dark in the pre-modern world, somebody's reciting silently, you could walk right into them. So if it's dark, they should be reciting out loud. That means before sunrise, the Fajr prayer should be allowed. Not Buhr, which is the noon prayer. Not the afternoon prayer. But after sunset, it starts to get a little dark. And then the night prayer is dark. right? So if there's darkness outside, you're going to recite out loud. Just a mnemonic of sorts. Correct. Correct. Same if you're praying on your own in, in a home. And... Um, and, and that goes for the way we cover is the same if we're alone or we're with people. The way we recite out loud, it's whether we're alone or with people. If you're following a prayer leader, the prayer leader will recite out loud and everybody else just listens. Yeah. Any questions here? Yes. Um, it's definitely important to do what's helpful to keep you attentive. That's definitely the case. Um, but there are also, again, these divine wisdoms in certain things. So, for example, let's say I had the opposite problem. Let's say when I recite out loud, I get distracted by the own sound of my voice. Um, what we would say is there's, there's still, in order to... You, 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 we should pray the way the Prophet, peace be upon him, prayed. The way the Prophet Muhammad prayed. And he prayed these first two out loud, and the third would be silent, or the first two out loud. So I would, even if I found that somewhat distracting, there's something in that that I have to say, okay, maybe I have to learn how to develop my concentration or my focus with it out loud, or when it's silent. Um, so you can do things that are conducive to help you, but you should also... Um, seek out whatever divine wisdom is there. Um, because, I mean, early on when people are learning, they tend to do almost everything out, out loud. That's very common. Even the invocations later, not just the Qur'an recitation. That, and that's okay. As you're learning, th 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 those are all okay. But as a, as a goal, even if you find reading out loud to be distracting, it's important to learn how to read out loud for certain things. Or if you find silence to sometimes be challenging, then maybe you're, maybe you're supposed to develop some kind of ability to concentrate even in silence. So there's benefit in both. Um, and, and as you're learning, that's fine, but I would say to try to seek to do both 
in their appropriate thing is, is best. Yeah, definitely. And then even if, even, if you're, even if you're just whispering to yourself and so nobody else can hear you, that's, that's still silent. But you're just, if it just helps you to make sure that you're, you're concentrating, you're saying things appropriately, um, but it wouldn't be loud enough for someone else to hear, then that would still be silent, so to speak. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So each one has a beginning time and an end time. So you just, as long as you get it between the beginning time and the end time. So for Fajr, the beginning time is the beginning of dawn. And then the end time is when the sun starts to rise. Depending on where you are in the world, what time of year is it, summer, winter, that's, that might be shorter, might be longer. But, you know, um, but that's kind of a shorter, a shorter prayer window, generally. Um, and then Dhuhr, the second, the, the noon prayer, um, is, a, is a larger time window because it's from when the sun moves past the, the zenith at the top to when the shadow of an object is equal to its length. Um, and then Asr is also about that same time frame. It ends up being about the same duration of time. Uh, Maghrib, which is a sunset prayer, tends to be shorter as well. Those are the two short time windows, the Fajr and the Maghrib. Um, because from sunset until the red of the twilight disappears is, tends to be shorter in time. But it depends on where you are in the world, and it depends on all of that. Yeah. You know, there are apps now. Most people use the apps to define the prayer times. The one thing I would say is if you add a little bit, you know, just to make sure that it's in. So if it says a prayer comes in at 1230, I think it's sometimes just good to wait an extra 15 minutes to definitely make sure, you know, because the, the apps sometimes approximate. You know, they're kind of using calculations to approximate. So if you just say, okay, let me add 15, 20 minutes or definitely be safe that it's, it's most likely um, in. So at this point, yeah, chat. That's a great question. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you're traveling, meaning you're going to travel a distance, um, let's just say of there's, there's, there's a set distance, it's 48 miles. So if you're going to go more than 48 miles, driving, flying, doesn't matter what, what mode. Um, once you start your journey, and even if you're sort of halfway there, like once, once you leave, you can, um, you can sometimes combine the prayers, and there's a way to shorten the prayer. Um, we weren't going to cover this today, but I can cover it in a, in, in a very brief way, if, if that's okay. So if it's a four-unit prayer, it just it becomes a two-unit prayer while traveling. Um, and then you can combine the prayers, meaning the... Um, the two afternoon prayers, the Dhuhr and the Asr, which is the noon and the afternoon prayer, you could combine them. You could bring one earlier, bring one later. And it's the same for the two night prayers. They, they, they overlap as well. Yeah. But if you guys have questions about that, we can, we can discuss. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So you can never, you cannot pray Dhuhr before it's time. You can't pray any prayer before it's time, except Asr. You can bring it into the Dhuhr time, or you can bring Dhuhr into Asr. You can delay. You can delay Dhuhr, the noon prayer, into the afternoon, or you can bring the afternoon into. But you can't before noon, like at 11 a.m. You can't pray either of them. Okay, so the prayer has to come in, and they share. They're sort of like sister prayers, so. If you're traveling, then you could do that. But if you're not traveling, then you should try to pray them in their times. Um, 
But let's say your meeting started at noon and didn't end, and you, had, you, know, you couldn't find, let's just say you didn't have a way to take a break. Um, you shouldn't pray at 11.30 because it's not in yet. It would be better to pray after the meeting. Yeah. Yeah, so um, if you miss a prayer, um, you owe the prayer. So you should always make up a prayer that you miss. So if, and you know, there's sometimes circumstances that are beyond your control, but you should try to keep track of those and say, okay, I got stuck in traffic or whatever it might be. Um, As you advance, you'll get better at planning for it, right? And you'll sort of start to have a sense of, oh, I need to pray and this is going to take me this long. But, um, you know, it takes time to get there as well. This is a new daily practice. Um, and so as you're working there, if you miss one, when you just make it up when you, when you get that chance. Yeah. And this is even if you miss it unintentionally, like you oversleep and you wake up and the sun is already up. You're like, oh, I didn't pray Fajr. Then just pray it once you're up. Yeah. So questions. Was this helpful? Do you guys feel... Like a good foundation to, yeah. The rest of it will really be, I'm hoping this prayer card, you know, you can just practice and stand and, okay, think it through, what would I say in this position, Allahu Akbar. Um, The legend here, do you guys see the legend on the the second panel? It'll tell you the numbers, which invocation, but also the two kinds of arrows. The arrow means Allahu Akbar, but the white arrow you would say semi Allahu liman hamida, for example, if, if if you're looking to learn that invocation. That's the one exception to a transition um, being Allahu Akbar. Yeah. And then if you guys have questions that you come up with afterwards, maybe we can come up with a way to gather questions or you know, feel free to um, reach out and ask. We're we're always here, inshallah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so let's say, I, I mean, you would just try to take your best guess at how many days you might have missed, right? So let's say, let's say I converted a week ago, and I'm still learning how to pray, and I'm only praying if there's somebody that can lead me, for example. That might be a, a really reasonable, many people are, are in that. So I would just keep track of, okay, so four days I wasn't able to do my prayers, etc. Um, and like any other debt, you just sort of chip away at it. Like on any given day, you could say, okay, let me, let me make up these prayers that I owe. And you could pray a Fajr prayer. It doesn't have to be in the time of Fajr. A prayer that you owe, you can pray at any time. So you say, okay, I owe this prayer, I owe two days of prayers, three days of prayers. Um, yeah, and then you just chip away at it. But be easy on yourself as well, like as you learn and as you, you know, there's a, you know, there's the things that God asks of us, um, and, and God is forgiving, and as long as you're putting your effort to learn, uh, then, you know, inshallah, I think that'll be, just, just do your best. Don't stress yourself out. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things I think is there are, the, the two, um, the two extremes are becoming complacent and saying, ah, I got plenty of time to learn, I'm new to this, right? And then there's kind of really overburdening and panicking right? Um, I think you want to kind of go somewhere in the middle. Realize, like, you know, be merciful with yourself. Give yourself time to learn, inshallah. Um, but also dedicate the time and the energy to learn. You know, this is, uh, invest in your, in your worship. Yeah, yes. I'm really glad you asked that. No, they do not. So if, if, so women who are on their cycle um, are not only excused from the prayer, but they don't make that up. Now there is an exception, there's a different ruling for fasting, because Ramadan is coming up, so I, I'm going to touch upon this. You do make up the, the, uh, the fast from, from your cycle, but you don't make up prayers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if you're sick, I know this isn't a Ramadan uh, fasting thing, but if you're sick, or you're traveling, those are, or you're nursing, or you're pregnant, and you really feel like it, it would be a burden on, on the baby or something like that, 
those are also excuses to break your fast, but you'll always owe those fasts. Ramadan fasts, you'll always owe them. They're kind of like the, 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 the prayer that you don't have an excuse from. But menstruating women and postpartum as well, the, the two types of bleeding, they don't have to make up those prayers. No. Okay, maybe any other questions? I, I'll, I'm, I'll hang out for a bit if you guys have questions that you don't want to ask in front of the group. But inshallah, let's conclude with a dua, a supplication, a prayer. Inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Oh Allah, we ask you to open our hearts and to illuminate our hearts and to fill our hearts with faith. We ask you to make the prayer a means of our growing nearer to you and to having a relationship with you and that we draw near and we gain love and we attain faith and piety through the prayer. We ask you to make the prayer a source of comfort and light for each of us. We ask you to ease us, ease and facilitate the learning for each of us here. Whoever is intending to draw near to you, Ya Allah, please make it easy for them. If they're having a difficulty with learning, may you remove it from them. May you accept our prayers, accept our efforts, despite our deficiencies and our shortcomings. You are the ever merciful. You are in no need of us. We are the ones who are in need of you. And we ask you to uh, bless everyone here, bless their families and loved ones. If anybody has a difficulty in their lives, Ya Allah, may you lift it. And if anybody's dealing with an illness, may you cure them. If anyone has sadness, may you bring them joy.